let's start this one off on a light note. Man, did those lyrics suck that the older brother wrote for the 20th anniversary. I guess he did have his work cut out for him with the names Harv and Marge, I guess Harvey and Marjorie, but they were bad. Okay, I really don't mean to be a bastard here, but is it just me, or is Lolita seriously played by a transgendered Edward Furlong? I liked how you could really sense that her deal was basically she was attracted to Brandon, who perhaps really was more interested in Dawn. You know, maybe Brandon needed someone lower than him so that he wouldn't lose control in the relationship, so that he would be the one in power. At first I really didn't understand why Dawn evidently sought him out after he told her that he was going to rape her. I mean, that first time I wasn't really sure if she was telling the truth, or if she was actually trying to get away from him. I mean, she ran off when she got the chance. But then after that, she did go with him, you know, several times. They meet up at least three times. But I guess it was just that here was actually some attention, you know, from the opposite gender, that maybe she perceived as not being entirely negative. It was excruciating to watch her with Steve. She was so clearly just fawning over him. I kept just dreading that he would suddenly catch on to it. You know, he seemed to be completely oblivious of her interest in him. You know, because if he did realize it, she would of course be humiliated. You know, and the finger fucking thing and watch my fingers. I mean, she most likely did not even know what it meant. She just wanted to have him, you know. She probably wasn't ready for sex, but if that was the only way, then she was willing to. And not because she thought she would enjoy the sex, but because she was blinded by her having fallen in love with him. Is it just me, or did anyone else believe Dawn's fantasy in New York at first. I mean, it became incredibly evident that of course it was a fantasy before she woke up. But for just a couple of seconds, it was just humongous weight off your shoulders. You felt relieved. You felt like, what's gonna happen to Dawn? And then she's on the phone with her older brother, and she was with the neighbor the entire time. Yeah, I did kind of think that it might be a hint that that one party guest seemed very interested in her. You know, there was that shot during the party itself, and then they mention it as they're watching the video. And that was also one of the only places where the film wasn't entirely realistic in how the kidnapping played out. I guess something like it has probably happened or could, but it's not bad writing. It's that Salons wants to underline this is how fucking lucky Missy is. Even when she gets kidnapped, she gets everything she wants. And Dawn is the one in pain. I thought it was also incredibly courageous to actually show her with the hammer, seriously considering, you know, hitting her little sister and her, you know, not giving her the note. The chocolate cake scene was just unbelievably cruel. And the worst part of it is, parents have actually done that. About the ending, I guess you could say it really isn't a conclusion. I mean, I guess you could interpret it as her singing along somewhat weakly was a, like, mild, going with the flow, I will survive kind of thing, although from what I've heard of palindromes, she doesn't. And anyway, it would have been wrong to have it be full of hope. I mean, nothing we've seen in the film has indicated that her life would change for the better, and it doesn't feel like such a thing has been cut out to make sure that the film was dark enough. And no, we shouldn't have had a 
flash forward to years later and oh, I made it, it worked out okay. It should stay in that stage of her life, in that sense of complete hopelessness. It isn't meant to be uplifting or life-affirming. It's meant to be reality. Anyway, those are my thoughts on Welcome to the Dollhouse. I hope you enjoyed it. I will see you next time.